And when you think back to your childhood, what was your favorite cereal? Captain Crunchberry. Captain Crunchberry. Yes. Wow. But I would always eat the yellow ones first, and that way I had all the berries last. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have to say that Apple Jacks was really close yeah. for me. Uh, it might have been my favorite. I liked Apple Jacks. I loved... Uh, I, li- I like Captain Crunch, too. Yeah. I was I, a I granola was a, kid, too. Grazer I wasn't brand. a big Trix kid. I wasn't yeah. a big... Uh, um, uh, what's that? The the little leprechaun with the marshmallows. Lucky Charms. Lucky Char- I wasn't yeah. a big Lucky Charms person. Yeah, they were all right. But um, I always I always liked Apple Jacks. Hello, friends, and welcome back to another episode of the Bourbon Road Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Shannon. And I'm your host, Todd Ritter. We've got a great show for you today. So grab your favorite pour and join us. Hey, you roadies. It's Diane Strong with Bourbon on the Banks Festival. We have got a great event planned for you this year. I can't wait to tell you all about it. Hang out for the half and I'll give you some more details. I hope to see you October 5th on the Banks in Frankfort, Kentucky. All right, folks, we got a really uh, interesting show for you today. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, We're going to actually do something a little different today than we've ever done before. And that is uh, we're actually going to have our warm up pour to start off the show. Yeah. A lot of times we'll have that pour in advance of the show just to warm up our palates and make sure as we're tasting things, it's not on a uh, on a virgin palate for the day. I like it to think of my old sporting days. It's like palate stretching. Yeah. That's kind of the way I see it. It's like warm up exercises. Yeah. 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 Instead of bending and touching my toes, I'm taking a sip of something and just getting the palate ready for the, for the day. Yeah. So forewarning, there are no bourbons on the show today, even in the warm up here, there's not a bourbon. No, not today. Not today, but we do have some whiskeys and we have some other things Now we won't let the cat out of the bag just yet. Okay. But, uh, but Todd, you had reached out to me and said, Hey, why don't we do something off road? And I'm yeah. thinking to myself, wait, I already sold my Jeep. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like hop in my four wheel drive truck. Let's go. Jay. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you mean by that? Uh, just, you know, sometimes you're, you can get a little tired of bourbon or, um, rise and that kind of thing. So like, you know, if you're looking for something a little different, that's kind of, you know, maybe give these a whirl. We've got some, uh, got a wide variety of, uh, stuff that obviously some you'll, you'll have heard of. And then others probably I'd expect might be the first time you've ever heard of it. Now we've, we've done things on the show before that are not bourbons or rise. And, and we kind of always said, we'll take a side road once in a while. Right. But I, I actually like off road. That, I like that term a lot better. So Thank we're you. we're going off road today. Yeah, well off road. <laughs> All right. Well, in our in our warm up glass is in fact a rye whiskey though. It is. Um, I was lucky to be chosen to. Uh, this is a uh, Bardstown rye that I helped mash uh, mash and drum. Jason Clory picked just this Thursday, so we got to take a little sample home with us. And this is a uh, a ninety five five rye. Came in, I believe, at 118 proof. And with their rye single barrels, they're also still doing that cherry wood that they get from, I believe it's from West Virginia. Yeah. So they're still doing that process. And this one was actually used in a second use, um, that cherry wood barrel. So the other three were in the first time use, been like real different. So this one really stuck out and it was aged in it for like 18 months. So this is about, yeah, like a six year rye. And it's really, uh, it's really different. Yeah. So this is literally fresh out of the barrel. You pulled it. It's, it's currently Sunday. Three days ago, you pulled this out of the barrel. Yeah. Yeah. Fresh out of the barrel. We had uh, six of us on the pick and yeah, a lot of fun and all four, you know, you always love one of those like outlier picks. I think I've talked about that. Like, it's always nice when you get one that's just like, you know, the, the angel seeing this is the one kind of thing. And yeah, this was really tough. I mean, we knocked two of the barrels out. And they were all, you know, actually, I thought the best nose was on the very first one we we uh, took out of the running, but it just didn't have the the palate. I mean, it was still a nice palate, but just didn't sure didn't linger like that nose did. Wow. But 
Well, let's try this. And when we're done, we'll talk a little bit more about the pig. Sure. So I expect you'll probably start to see these more often. I know some of their um, single barrel bourbons are are hitting shelves out there a lot of places. I know Total Wines had some. And... Okay, so we're dealing with a rye here that's at or above six years, at or just above six years old. Yeah, I don't know if that included uh, the actual aging. And I think you can actually include that now. I believe they changed how that works. So as long as it goes directly from barrel to barrel? I believe so. So this is a single barrel placed into another single barrel. So it wasn't bashed and then re-single barreled, right? Like I said, this one was out of the, the rye was put into the cherry wood. Yep. And then put in a second use cherry wood. I'm, I'm, yeah. Got it. But uh, I'm just wondering if they maintained the integrity of the original single barrel or if it was a batch process back to a single barrel. I would assume single Bat- barrel to... S- to batch, then back to single barrel or single uh, barrel? Single barrel to single barrel. Oh, wow. Yeah. See, that's an expensive way to do it. Yeah. And it's a, well, it's a it's a risky way to do it, too. But you end up with a lot more variety. Yeah, very for sure. Yeah. Well, I love the nose on it. It does have a nice uh, little bit of a smoky note to it. Um, yeah, that barrel char. Yeah. Shines. So the barrel has definitely played a big part in, in the nose on this one. Darker fruits. Yeah, so um, almost a, and I say this a lot, but when I get it on the nose, it, it you're trying to imagine what it's going to be on the palate. And I always think it's going to be like a fruit jam. It's going to be a little jammy. Here's to the palate. Cheers. Cheers. Mm, that's got a nice, nice texture to it. Yeah. Comes off it, a little root beerish. A little bit. A little sassafrasy. Yeah, and it really does kind of um, hit your whole palate at once. It doesn't kind of work its way back. It kind of just introduces itself everywhere. Yeah, the uh, spicy cinnamon kind of sits <laughs> yeah. on the tongue a long time. That's what, I think that's why it did so well. It just had this finish that just doesn't go away. Yeah, it does. It does have a nice texture to it, and it, that always leads to like a finish that just lasts a little bit longer. I think anytime it's a little more sticky, a little bit more uh, viscous, it'll tend to hang around a little bit longer. Yeah, the cinnamon is probably for me the most prominent note on this, um, but I think it's it's almost like a um, like a cinnamon chalk candy kind of a um, um, I don't know. The Neckos you were talking Neckos, about. Neckos, yeah, mm-hmm. Necco Candy. Why can't I ever remember that name? <laughs> but um, I, I'm a big, like, sometimes I eat late, and sometimes it's not the best food to eat late, like a taco or something. <laughs> so, you know, Tums are kind of by my bedside. Gotcha. And Tums taste a heck of a lot better these days than they used to. Yeah, I actually have some of the chewy ones, and they're like candy. Yeah. So, yeah, that that chalky kind of... Uh, candy, uh, Neckos, Necco wafers, I guess is what it is. But this has got like fireball poured all over them. Yeah. Yeah. Really good. Do you think this drinks higher than six year age or lower? I'd say it, I think it drinks a little, little younger maybe. And that might just because it, like we said, it's about a four, four plus year and then. The 18, 19 months in the, yeah. the second might have. So that, that secondary finishing is not really adding that uh, depth of age to it. It's just adding that depth of flavor. Yeah, definitely. Well, fantastic. So tell me a little bit about this pick and uh, and what was the kind of the theme of the pick? So this is a pick for um, Mash and Journeys going to have an event in late September. I think it's the 28th, 29th, and it's going to be in Bardstown and. Uh, the Bardstown Blitz is what they're calling it. And so we met and did this pick and this will be a part of like the through their Patreon. And now it's actually open to the public. You can I believe it's 120, 125, no, maybe 175 for a ticket. And they've got events lined up and a bottle share. And then you if you pay for a ticket, you'll also get a bottle, bottle of this uh, this ride we just pick here. Yeah. So. It's a nice little deal. Well, 175 is is uh is probably a fair price for for an event like that, a weekend event. 
uh, with without uh, a bottle. So to get a bottle on top of it, it's pretty yeah. Good deal. One of the events they're going to have is actually at Bardstown where you can pick up your bottle and yeah, and there'll be tours and all that. Yeah. Well, that's a couple of weeks after. Well, not quite a couple of weeks. Almost a couple of weeks after the the Bardstown Bourbon Festival, and then like the week before. The week before, yeah. Bourbon on the Banks. Yeah, that was kind of a bad part because Scott and Jason both came to Bourbon on the Banks last year, and so with this going on, they're not gonna obviously not gonna come back the next week and right. do it all over again. But yeah, yeah, we'll we'll miss them there, but yeah, uh, we'll be there. We'll be there this year. Yes, with, yes. Uh, with our bells on. Bells and on. Big, big 30 foot tent and Rep- all the goodies. Yeah, representing the hometown. Um, we just learned recently from Diane Strong that all the general admission tickets are sold out. And if you're wanting to come, there's still some Twilight tickets left, and they may open a few more of those up to folks. Um, the crowd can tend to thin a little bit after a couple hours simply because people are starting to. Fill up on their bourbon and they're, they're wise enough to say, I need a little break. Yeah. Yeah. It does really, uh, you know, you have that early, early rush and then yeah, a couple hours later you, you start seeing. Yeah. I would definitely say folks, if, uh, if you hadn't picked up your tickets for bourbon on the banks this year, um, I'm not going to say shame on you, but I will say we've mentioned it enough on the show. You should have been aware that it's something you need to get on board for, but a twilight ticket is a perfect answer to that problem. Yeah. I mean, you'll get, I think you get to come in at four, four and it's like four to six, maybe four to six. And then the rest of the evening events as well. Plus you can come in on Thursday before it and, and do all the other stuff. Right. There'll be a, uh, after party there real close to where all the, uh, the, uh, distilleries are be pouring. And yeah. And there's also tickets for some of the other special events like the, um, I believe there's a few left for the Peggy No Stevens uh, bourbon tasting uh, and food food sure, pairing. The pairing, and then there's also a few tickets left for a um, boat trip with. Uh, oh yeah, uh, Miss Wibbles, um, Heather Wibbles, Heather Wibbles, yes, cocktail contessa, cocktail contessa, and you actually get a you get a free book with that, and you get to try like three or four different cocktails, I believe, and appetizers. So, Well, they're just listening, folks, to the, the halftime uh, spot we have for Bourbon on the Banks. Uh, you'll get all those details. But uh, I highly suggest if you had any, end, you know, any idea about showing up this year for the event, uh, don't consider yourself out of the running just because you didn't get a general admission ticket. You can still pick up a Twilight admission ticket and still attend all the other events that are happening Uh Along with this. And it starts Thursday, actually, I think, with an event and then the, the kickoff party at uh, Whiskey Thief. Whiskey Thief, yeah. So, I mean, even if you weren't going to do the whole Saturday, Sunday thing, I mean. You can do that for sure. Come out to the Whiskey Thief. I mean, it's going we'll to be, be a there. lot of fun. I mean, I'll be there. Are you yeah. going to be there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's, that's a good deal. Love those so, guys. Looking forward to it. Well, this is a great rye whiskey. I think, um, I think I'd like to own a bottle of this. Pretty nice stuff. Yeah. Good. They say there. they ended up with like 150, 160 bottles out of that barrel. Um, I think that it's going to be more like probably in that 180, 200, probably. I mean, six year. Okay. Well, what one? I was just reading one of uh, Jason's posts, and he got like 160. Maybe I'm confusing it. Uh, that might have been the other pick they just finished up, not this one. Yeah, the copper and cast. The copper and cast. Yes. That's right. Yeah, Jason's notorious for he and Scott sometimes get really short barrels and that's just it's kind of a luck of the draw you mean yeah. you can out, get an outstanding pick and it could well sometimes roll out 50 or 60 bottles is all you'll get out of it sometimes i think more times than not a short barrel can turn out to be really good yeah. really delicious and that's why you end up picking them not realizing how short the barrel is right, so right. you win on one hand you lose on another at the end of the day it's all a wash yeah all right well uh, in addition to keeping a mind open to, to attending bourbon on the banks even with a a twilight ticket if you didn't get your general mission. Um, Jason and Scott still have some tickets available for their event. So Yes, they do. And you can probably find those on the, probably their best place would be to find it would be on their Mashing Journey um, Facebook page, I would say. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they're crazy, crazy guys. They pick like a whiskey a week almost. I mean, they're just so I'm, busy. I'm not sure what they're up to, but I've been on three or four with them easy. Yeah. Yeah. But they're definitely in 
70, 80, 100. Yeah. Great, like that. Great yeah. palates. Yeah. All great right. Guy. So it's time to let the cat out of the bag. I, I feel warmed up. What about you? Yeah. Yeah. I'm ready to get off road, so to speak. All right. As we take a turn off the pavement here and we sort of head off road. I'm going to head south here. For the oh, first we're heading court. south. Yeah, way south. So are we crossing the border? Yes. We're going to go south into uh, Mexico. Awesome. And this is a product called Sotol. And Sotol is derived from a shrub in the genus, and I might might murder this because I don't know my Latin very well, but Decilerion. And it's also, it's better known as the Desert Spoon. And while it's probably related to agave, it's not. It's not agave. Okay. So. So this cannot be called tequila. This cannot be called tequila. All right. Well, this Sotol is spelled S-O-T-O-L. Yes. And. uh it's hard to find. Uh, I went to Total Wine recently, and a friend of mine um, that's in the formerly in the Bourbon Society board, he's the one that kind of introduced me to this, and I was really, really taken aback because you know, I, since it's a Mexican product, I thought, well, it's going to be similar to tequila or mezcal, but yeah, I, I think this is. It's got some subtle nuances and differences from those two. Awesome. Well, let's check it out. I can tell by the the, the look of it. It it looks like a like a, a silver tequila yes. or a vodka. This, yes. Clear, so this clear is, liquor. This is kind of runs that same way. There's, there's a Blanco or Plata version. There's a Reposado and there's an Anejo. And the Plata or Blanco versions are unaged. The Reposado are aged anywhere from, I think it said a couple months to almost a year. Whereas the Anejos are a year older. So anytime you hear the word Anejo, you know, it's spent, the minimum of one year in the barrel. Right. This is quite clear. This is uh, this is white dog, basically. Yeah, this is <laughs> straight distill it. So this is 80 proof and it uh, $42 okay. out the door. Um, this brand is actually called Kazool 100. Okay. Yeah. Wow. It, it smells like a Cristalino tequila. Okay. A sort of a filtered... Añejo or filtered reposado. I get like this lightly smoked, like lime. Yeah. Lemon. It does have a lime note to it on the nose already. Yep. And is that, in your opinion, is that where it differs is from that, that little that light citrusy fruit note? Yeah. And that's what I really, really enjoyed about it. Yeah. I mean, this is like a pool sipper and I've yet to try it in any kind of cocktails, but. I, I think I'm going to give it a whirl soon. The reason I brought the Cristalino, because I was just wondering, is this is this truly? So this, this at all has not entered a barrel ever. This particular one, no. Because you would never know with Cristalino that it had been in a barrel. By the time they get done filtering, it's back to its clear nature, but it had spent time in a barrel. So when I first got that smoky note on, I'm thinking, so this hadn't gotten in a barrel at one point or another? Not, not that it said. But it's not overly smoky. It's just a light hint. No, it's almost like, like I said, like grill marks yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Like, I, mean, I don't want to say grilled pineapple, but. My nose tells me it's going to be on a sweeter side, but let's taste it. Cheers. Cheers. And it's not overly sweet. It's kind of really balanced. Yeah. Wow. Well, herbaceous, vegetal, herby. Yeah, definitely, definitely herby. Um, not getting a lot of citrus on the palate. I am getting that herbal note. Still has that smoky kind of nature to it. It's very pleasant. It has a little bit of medicinal band aid. Yeah, to, just a on hair. the back end. Once it sits, I think on the, that second sip is where I start getting the citrus. I probably need to rinse my palate after that ride. Well, failed at that. Yeah. Yeah. And this is similar. You get this on some, uh, uh, some, sometime on smoky, uh, single malts, you know, yeah. you get, you get that, um, that medicinal note. It kind of reminds you of when you were a kid. I don't know if, if you're in the older generations, like, like we are, I'm a little bit older than you, but, um, when we would get a toothache as a child, you'd have these little, 
cotton things that were soaked in this. Um, I remember those, but I can't remember what it was called. It was some, some, they put a dropper and they put it on these little cotton things and you'd push it back in your jaw next to your tooth and it would numb you. Can't. Camp camphor? No. no. Um something cane, Novocaine or something like that. Yeah. Right? Well anyway, it reminds me of that horrible note. Because when you're a kid <laughs> and you got a toothache, everything's right. horrible, right? right? <laughs> but um it's very light and uh so it's that light medicinal note. If uh if you're a scotch drinker uh and you like peated scotches and you like some of them that are a little bit more on the smoky side, uh you'll be familiar with this note. But interesting, that's coming from a very clear, unaged spirit. Yeah. What's pretty fascinating about this is like the plants they use, it takes um, 15 to 25 years for them to grow into maturity to, to use. And one plant usually yields one bottle. That's yeah. the way it kind of works. So, Can you imagine the first guy you know, living in the desert, right? Because it's, it's, it's pretty much desert down there. Let's just be fair. Um, the first guy that finally figured out how to make something spirit, made a spirit out of some desert plant. He's like, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Right. Right. <laughs> it still fascinates me. Just like, I don't know the history, like who decided let's try this and you drink it first kind of thing. You know, it's <laughs> right. like, I made this, you try it though. I could drink this. I could drink this. Uh, I could spend a day with this. No problem. Uh, I really like it. It, it does, it is totally out of the box of a tequila. Yeah. I mean, when you drink it, when you first taste it, you're like, okay, yeah, this is in the tequila family, mezcal family, right? There are some similarities, but I think there are also some differences that make it stand out. Yeah. But yeah. Well, if tequila is kind of your, um, something you like and you enjoy from time to time, I would say give so tall a a, a chance yeah. you might really go enjoy off road this. if you will yeah go off road fantastic okay so you mentioned it was not easy to find but when you did find it what was the price on a bottle this was 42.99 okay so at, very, at total wine very approachable price and they had one the i'm talking of the went to the lexton one so they had one other brand and I, I want to say it was even cheaper, maybe like thirty four ninety nine. And what's and the I, brand on this one? This is called Kazool One Hundred. Kazool One Hundred. One Hundred means not proof, or no? Like no, I said it's eighty proof. It actually confused me as well when I first saw it. I was like, oh, because usually your tequilas and mezcals, it's there's no true cask proof or you know high proof. So it's usually eighty eighty six is what I think tends to make maybe a 90 proof out there, but. Well, I think you picked a, a good one to start with. Um, and the reason is, is because what follows is going to be a little bit more, I, I don't know, a little bit more palate um, disrupting, I would say. <laughs> and and this, so when you're drinking whiskeys like these, it's very important to have them in a good order, Right. Like, yeah, for sure. I mean, you don't want to you don't say, want Freud to jump, be your first. Yeah, day. jump on a smoky scotch and then straight to <laughs> something like this. Right, exactly. Yeah. Well, I I like it a lot. I think I'm going to go find me a bottle of yeah, it. Yeah, I thought you might enjoy that because yeah. I knew you you kind of like some nice tequilas and things. So. Yeah, I'm actually heading to Mexico tomorrow morning at 7:30. I'll be flying out to Puerto Vallarta. Very nice. And uh, yeah, I'm spending an entire week on the west coast. Of Mexico, so many times in the past, Melody and I and our friends have found our way to the East Coast, you know, Cancun and uh, Playa del Carmen and all those places, and never been to the West Coast. Have you? No, I've never been to Mexico. Period. Oh, as yet. Okay. Well, it's in your future, I'm sure. It's a great trip. Uh, of course, you got little ones at home, and I don't know. I don't know that Mexico is the right vacation spot. Not yet. Not we'll yet. see. Yeah. One of these days. Maybe if they visit Disney Mexico or something, maybe we'll get down there. Who knows? <laughs> oh, what a great way to start out the show. So we've had a great, great rye whiskey from the Mashing Journeys Barrel Pick for their big event in, in Bardstown here coming up uh, at the end of September. We just had a Soltol, which is a Mexican spirit made out of, what's the plant? The spoon plant? Yeah, Desert Spoon. Desert Spoon. 
Not a not a tequila. Legally can't be called a tequila because it's not made from agave. No, but it actually has its own appellation of origin, which um, there are three areas it's supposed to come from, and that's Chihuahua, uh, Coahuila, and Durango. There, okay. and then it's actually called when it's distilled elsewhere. It's called anywhere from Pamilla uh, or Cucharillo, and there's even a Texas version of Sotel too because it wow. can be fine. Can be uh, distilled and found there. I think you worked on your accent a little bit. I've been told I have a nice, uh, yeah, in my Spanish. I, I took really well. I mean, to that language, and I can yeah. show my R's and you know the E's, you know the double L's where you have to. Yeah, good deal. Yeah, so I was always told I have good pronunciation. All right, so we're gonna move on. Our second pour of the off road is uh, I brought this one. And uh, this is uh, this is a mezcal, and uh, this is a mezcal from a company called Illegal, or if you were to pronounce it in English, Illegal, <laughs> <laughs> uh, spelled I L E G A L. This is a añejo mezcal, which means it has spent at least one year in a barrel, and you can tell by looking at it, it has the color of a uh, lightly aged whiskey. Yeah. So looks like it's been about a year in a barrel. I would say, yeah, a year, maybe a year and a half. Yeah. And uh, Mezcal is different uh, from tequila, slightly different. I mean, they're not altogether different, not like so tall and, and tequila, but right. uh, Mezcal, they're still in the same family, right? Yeah. Tequila is actually Mezcal. It just happens to come from the blue agave plant. Right. Whereas Mezcal, I believe you said... Um, this particular version you it's have is Espadin. Espadin. Yeah. Espadin uh, agave. agave. So definitely a different agave plant. And how they treat the piñas. The, yeah, which is the heart or the, the core heart. of the of the plant. So if you've seen an agave plant, it looks a lot like a pineapple. More or less kind of like a, a big, very spiky one. Yes. Very <laughs> spiky pineapple. And if you, uh, if you cut off all the leaves, you end up with this little ball thing. And that's the piña. Where all the leaves have been cut off, it's really the core of the plant. It's yes. the, it's the heart of the plant, and and uh, harvesting an agave plant is killing the plant. Yes, so it is the end of the life of that plant. But on mezcal, uh, they and, and tequila is made many different ways in how they roast the piñas, but with mezcal, it's typically done over an open fire pit. Yeah, tequila is typically like, kind of like a. Because you think of it as like a large conventional oven type right. type deal where they roast it, or yeah. they but, have to cook it down. They have to get it to the point where it converts its sugars. And right. but uh, the Espadina agave in this case is uh, is done so over lava and 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 yeah, hot we saw coals like lava and, rocks and wood and yeah. Now illegal is considered uh, one of the upper level mezcals. Was kind of a I mean not. That it's horribly expensive, but that is considered a finer mezcal. Okay. So you can certainly buy mezcal uh, for $20 a bottle if you want, or you can get mezcal for uh, $2,000 a bottle if you want. Or on my shelf. Or more. This one, uh, this one, the Illegal uh, Añejo, uh, comes in somewhere between $90 and $110 a bottle. Okay. And that's actually a 375 This is a 375 but the, the oh, 750 so the is okay. going to cost you about 90 to 110 okay. That's not – the grand scheme of things, that's not too bad. What do you think about that nose? I'm getting the herbal thing again, but mm-hmm. it's like – there's like a big – like it's vanilla, which I'm expecting is coming from those barrels that they use too. Yeah, I think it does have a little bit of a vanilla cream note to it. Um, the smokiness is there, although because there was smokiness in the last pour we had, it's not as toning this one down just I, a little bit. Which I was kind of surprised. Yeah, I've had a few other mezcals and they always seem to be a little more smoky. So I thought this might. Uh, this has a a little bit more of a cleaner nose to it. I'm not getting the medicinal note that we got yeah. off the Sotal. And that might be again that barrel age taking some of that. Sure. That sting out of it. I'm ready to taste it. Cheers. 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 
Yeah. So a little more texture with that. Definitely. Yes, for sure. Um, I don't know if the barrel added texture or the distillation process was more likely my guess. Uh, it is um, satiny, creamy, a little bit. Added to that little bit of vanilla note it has. Really makes it nice. Yeah, there's some caramel. Mm-hmm. Light caramel. I'm getting a slight hint of that medicinal note, but I am not too. a lot. It's yeah. a, on the on the very tail end. When it comes to tequila or mezcal, this is I would consider this very smooth, very um, evenly balanced as it crosses the palate. Yes, very much so. And this one's eighty proof. You said, yeah. You? This is an eighty proof okay. as well. Yeah, like I said, typically that's what you find your tequilas, mezcals, and apparently sell to a and this is a handmade tequila. Um, a lot of, and I, I know a little bit about Illegal because they just so happen to be my favorite uh, mezcal distillery, but uh, they're truly made by hand. There are a lot of places that claim made by hand, like, uh, well, let's not even, let's not even talk about um, tequila for a moment. Tito's handmade vodka. Yeah. Are we are we serious, folks? Uh, Do we really think Tito's <laughs> is made by hand? As many bottles as you see, that's a lot of hands. I mean, I would I would definitely raise concern about that claim. That um, what do they mean by by hand? <laughs> are there hands somewhere in the process? Yes, <laughs> hands on the buttons of the computers and things, maybe. But uh, illegal uh, mezcal is handmade. This is a handmade process. This is still, are you going to pay more for these bottles? It's more crafted. It's more painstakingly. Uh, you know, the the plants themselves are selected more carefully. Uh, it's truly a farm to bottle kind of product. That's really cool. And this is the añejo. They also have a reposado, uh, a little bit less. You'll pay about fifteen dollars less for the reposado. I was gonna say usually the way those things work. It's yeah, like you start with the silver or plata or blanco. It, yeah. Starts at a price and tends to go like Reposado will be $10, 15 $20 more. And yep. And Aho will be $10, $15 more. I haven't looked these up, and I apologize, folks, if I'm off by a little bit. I would expect the um, the silver to be somewhere around $65, 60, $60, yeah. $60, $75 or so for the Reposado, and then ni- around $90 plus. It just depends on how hard. It's, it, they, they don't have a huge production there. Right. I mean, a batch of their product yields about 4,800 bottles. So in the grand scheme of things, is not that not, not huge. Right. But they are available nationwide. You can't find them. And and thankfully, you know, Total Wine stocks illegal. So if, if it's something you find you like, you can get it. I like it because you can still get the distillate notes a little bit. Mm-hmm. But there's like these little... Hits of barrel character, like I said, the caramel and the. Well, I'm thinking we're we're going to be drinking in the second half here in a few minutes. I think our break's going to have to be just a little bit longer than just a quick one. Possible, as they say. Possible, yes, es possible. Es possible. <laughs> uh, because uh, these smoky notes off these are going to be, we're going to have to wash them off our palate. They're going to linger. Yeah, they're going to linger. What do you think about the the finish on this and and the length of the finish? It's really nice. Yeah, like you said, this is yeah, this is a beach pour. Man, I'm looking forward to it. I could I could just sit in the sunset and sip on this for for a while. Well, I'm kind of hoping you know with my trip tomorrow that I'll be able to have a few decent pours of tequila. I'm I'm probably not going to get them at our resort. We're staying at the secrets in Puerto Vallarta, which is a a nice resort, but they're all inclusive. Okay. Which usually means if you want something super top shelf, you still have to pay for it. Right. Right. And they'll have probably have a tequila bar there where you can buy specialty tequilas. And I, we did that the last time I had a little, uh, class Azul. Very nice. When we were in Playa del Carmen last year, but yeah, I think uh, I may have to find something. I love it. I'm glad we're taking this off-road trip. It's so amazing. Uh, I encourage our our roadies, our listeners to to explore other yeah. spirits. Step out of your comfort zone every once in a while. Yeah. You never know. And you, your palate can get tired, like you mentioned early on in the show. 
Uh, your palate can get a little tired of bourbon after a while. Not that you don't love bourbon and enjoy it, but but it's nice to have a a break. Right. We even talked about it on the last episode. Both you and I went on some vacations and you you said you tried some craft beer and that was kind of my jam for most of my week of vacation was trying just some different different craft beers out there. I had hoppy stuff. I had dark stuff, you know. Rode some roller coasters. Rode some roller coasters. <laughs> Survived some roller coasters. I think some. All right, folks. Well, we're going to take a quick break. I don't know if it'll be super quick, but uh, check out uh, what Diane has to say about bourbon on the banks. And we'll be back after. And we've got a couple more great pours. Not bourbons. Not tequilas this time. Not tequilas. Definitely not rice. We've got a fun second half coming up. So stick around. Hey, roadies, it's Diane Strong again with Bourbon on the Banks Festival. Thanks for waiting to hear the details about our event this year. I'm so excited. I want you to come into Frankfort, Kentucky on October 5th. We're going to celebrate along the banks of the Kentucky River. We've got over 70 distilleries this year. You get your sample glass and you get to go to town. Here's a real quick rundown of the events we've got going on. Thursday, we've got Mixology on the River with O.A. Ingram and Heather Wibbles. After that event, you can head out to Whiskey Thief Distilling for our official kickoff party. Friday, you can indulge in a bourbon pairing with no other than Peggy No Stevens. Freddie Johnson's going to join her for the fun, and you're going to be tasting some Buffalo Trace. Then get dressed up for our VIP reception and bourbon auction, courtesy of Whiskey Thief Distilling. You have a chance to bid on your very own barrel pick experience from both Whiskey Thief and Four Roses Distillery. And don't forget, if, you, if you're bringing your family, you need to head downtown on Friday night at about 6 o'clock because we have got an amazing free family-friendly event brought to you by Expree Credit Union. We've got fire performers, acrobats, street performers, music, food, tons of free activities for the kids. The main event, of course, is on Saturday, October 5th. This year, we've got over 70 distilleries to sample from which is included in your ticket price. We've got bourbon-themed merchants, live music, delectable food, and the event promises to be unforgettable. I want you to go to bourbononthebanks.org to get all the details for all the events we've got going on. Some are are ticketed, some are free, but I guarantee you're going to have a great time here in historic downtown Frankfort, Kentucky. Bourbon on the Banks Festival brought to you by Limestone Farms. All right, so we were back. We had a nice little break there. Time enough to sort of clear our palates just a little bit. But I have to be honest, I still have a little bit of a smoky note. I do too. Yeah. So it's <laughs> so, going to be interesting how that plays out. I'm wondering if we did this and maybe we should flip flop the first and second halves. Well, keep this in mind, folks. If you're if you're yeah. drinking uh, smoked whiskeys, they definitely need to be at the end of your uh, flight. But maybe the flavors of what we're getting ready to drink next will be so different that it won't won't play. Yeah. yeah. I feel but, like I, I just ate a piece of smoked Gouda. That's about the amount of smoke in my mouth. It's not like I drank a, a mezcal. Right, right. Yeah. But, I drink a lot of water to try to get to move it on down. It's hard to it's it's almost like drinking the the absinthe finished bear, you know, stuff. You just it has to be your last pour of the day. Yeah. The Freud similar kind of stuff right night cap night cap that's night right cap. so what do we have in our glass this half we're we're we're, we're departing mexico we've departing gone, mexico we but we're not really going too far north no we're we're staying in the south uh this is a louisiana rice whiskey and it's from jt Mellick. this particular version is a single barrel um again from my friends we i hope they're uh gonna send us some some love but uh from Mash and Journey, and this is 119 proof, 100% distilled from rice. This family has been farming in rice in Louisiana for since 1896. So long, long time. So it is a whiskey. So it is a whiskey. A whiskey has to be distilled from grains and it has to be aged in a barrel. Or aged in wood. Aged. Yes, and this is four plus years. Okay. And it's got a pretty good color to it. Yeah. It's got a nice uh, like golden amber. Now, rice whiskey 
itself does have a lot of rules associated with it, but only if it's made in Japan. J- Japanese rice whiskeys are very regulated, yes. very much uh, protected by Japanese law. But this is this has no claims as such. It's just a rice whiskey made in uh, Louisiana. Yeah, and there's I'm starting to see a few others. I believe I saw one from Arkansas that did pretty well in uh, some some awards uh, recently. So uh, maybe it could become a small small yeah, trend. You know, I'm wondering if uh, if anybody's going to make a whiskey out of the South Carolina the Carolina Gold Rice, which yeah. is like. Uh, you know that's at the heart of the South, right? That has that has been that was the crop that uh, launched South Carolina into the agricultural beast it was pre Civil War. Okay, and of course it's the same thing that uh, almost disappeared following uh, emancipation yeah. of our black population. So I, you know, it's got a good good points and bad to it. Carolina Gold Rice is pretty darn good, but I don't think they make a whiskey out of it yet. Or if they do, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Something to check out. Yeah. It's got a nice clean nose on it. Um, I'm not picking up a whole lot of nuttiness, but it, I, I think the fascinating I, it nose is like a, a bourbon. It kind of does. I, I the very first time I tried this, I mm-hmm. have friends and they sent me, you know, they'll send blind pours and they'll be like, "Here, check this out," and we'll you know have our own little personal Zoom or something like that, and we'll we'll talk about things and. You know, do I have the best palate in the world? No, but I've I've learned to recognize certain things. And I can usually maybe guess a distillery, and they're like, "You'll never guess the distillery on this." And I was like, the very first one I tried came off like Buffalo Trace. It was just so, yeah, just those Buffalo Trace notes I get. Yeah, I would say that I would have a hard time uh, if somebody asked me what the mash bill was on this, let's oh. say that was the only question. What's the mash bill on what you're drinking? You didn't know anything else about it. I might go weeded bourbon. I might th- tend to lean towards a little bit towards a weeded bourbon. I get a lot of vanilla. Like it's like almost like vanilla pudding. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's light. It's sweet. It's got a nice bourbon nose to it. It does. It does have like a sweet yeah. Very sweet notes. But the oak is there. The oak is very present. Mm-hmm. What was what was the age? Four years on this? Four again? plus. Four plus. Yeah. Okay. All right. Love the nose. Let's try the palate. Cheers. Yeah, cheers. Oh my goodness. That's like drinking silk. Oh my goodness. That's so good. Yeah. It's sweet. It is. It is. So that's the first indication that we're not drinking bourbon here. Not that it's sweet, but that silky sweetness that sort of drifts away from bourbon. Yes. And I'm going to go back in for a second pour just to see if it's changed a little bit more because, like like you said, we st- I still had a little bit of that smoke flavor going on. This is kind of, it kind of drifts towards syrupy pancake. Away from like bourbon and more towards like a syrupy pancake. That is amazing. Isn't that fun? That is really good stuff. Like, this is my, I guess I have gone through two other single barrels of this, and I have this one open right now, and then I just got another one from Bourbon Outfitter. Well, tell us what you know about JT Mellick. Uh, Not a great deal, but I think uh, I may reach out to them soon because I think... We, I would love to have them on the show for sure. I yeah, think, I, think, um, I think after after tasting this, and I think I have had one of their uh, whiskeys before, maybe on another show, maybe as a sample from a listener or maybe even with you at one point or another. I don't know. But uh, it wasn't this one. This one's. Yeah. It, maybe at a, did I bring, I may have brought some to a Frankfurt Bourbon Society bottle share. Just could have been. And I think that was. I think it was a pickup friend of mine. Like he was the one that sent me the JT Melek for the first time. He's in uh, Arkansas and he sent that to me blind. I was like, this is amazing. I was like, tastes like Buffalo trace. And he's like, I'll grab you a single barrel. And yeah. It's really, really good. I know. So th- are these guys in new Orleans? Um, they are branch, Louisiana branch. Yeah. No clue. I'm, yeah. No clue. I'm not. Okay. Well, but, um, 
They also raise crawfish, I found. So might be a good place to visit because you got crawfish, you got this whiskey. Oh, could you, you imagine think, sitting back? I was going to say, you got to think maybe a little restaurant on on the on the campus, if you will. Well, maybe we'll get down for the New Orleans Bourbon Festival next year. Not this year, of course, but uh, maybe next year. And we can have some crawfish and some uh, Melick Rice whiskey. Wow. It does say distilled from Louisiana Rice Providence style, which that'd be a great, like, what is Providence style? So, yeah. Yeah. But um, I think this ran about $65 for the single barrel. They just released a high proof small batch and it it runs about the same about 60 65 and then out there um and i'm, I'm pretty sure it's just i'm not sure how big of distrib- distribution they have but uh i know their small batch is about 40 45 bucks and do you know if they sell online i believe you could order direct i mean you know certain states you can order direct but i'm pretty sure just checking out their website uh a few days ago, yeah, I think you can order directly from them. I, like I said, Bourbon Outfitter has a couple of their single barrels. I've seen single barrels offered on um, Seal Box. So, it was was this one in particular available on Shared Pour or uh, this was Jason and like Jason Scott's pick, and I I can't remember if they went through Shared. I you know they do so many. It's, sure, it's either shared port or keg and bottle or seal box or yeah. So yeah, I mean this is a great pour of whiskey. It's really really good. A question I would have is: Are they all this good, or is this just an exceptional pick? I've not had the base. I think it's a ninety proof product. Yeah, uh, but so far I'm like three for three. Wow. Yeah, I tell you what. There's some there's some smaller distilleries out there that uh, are holding to their guns and doing their thing. And making some great whiskey. Yeah. And I think this is one of those fun ones. Like you have one of those friends that kind of thinks they know it. Not quite all, you know, not in a bad way, but you know, yeah. Like this is a good curveball. Just like pour them and say, try this and tell me what you think. Yeah. And then be like, ah, it's rice whiskey, my friend. <laughs> it's rice whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> I would never have guessed it, but I do, I do know that once it hit my palate and it started going, it started departing from bourbon after it hit my palate. But I mean, the nose and the first impression on the palate was bourbon. And then all of a sudden it started to depart a little bit. I'm like, okay, yeah, this is another animal, but it's got that, um, like, I don't know. It, I, I'm going to say it's that, uh, that cereal note. Yeah. A little uh, bit that, that, that made me say, uh, syrupy pancakes. Yeah. And for a four and a half, four plus, whatever yeah. that means, it's just it's so soft too, and I'm guessing that's just the rice whiskey distilled itself. Yeah, this is really that, good. What was the proof again on this? This one was one nineteen. One nineteen. I've seen them range, yeah, one sixteen to one twenty five eight. It kind of drinks right around there, I think. Yeah. You know, anywhere in the one ten to one twenty range. Their uh, their new high proof, I believe, is at one seventeen proof. I think. Okay. So yeah, I've yet to see that in the wild but I, I definitely want to give it a whirl all right rice whiskey now i had had some rice whiskeys in the past the only one that comes to mind is alchemy but it's it's also out of uh louisiana and uh i i had it early on i think it was an early release of it and for me it seemed a little young wasn't quite ready but okay. um but it was it was clear too oh okay so it was unaged but um, I think that uh, I'm. This sells me on rice as a as a grain for distilling, no doubt. Of course, Japanese have been doing it for a long time. Right. We right. talked about that. There's some fantastic rice whiskeys Agreed. out of Japan. But all the rice whiskeys out of Japan, they don't have these kind of notes to them. They, no, they have no. more of that uh, single malt kind. It of, does come off as very malty. Yeah. I might. I might almost say that. This could be a category in its own. Rice whiskey. Hopefully, if more American rice, more whiskey. distillers get into it, maybe it will be. It's just a lot of fun. Well, I know it would have to be a lot more because it took quite a bit of big push to get American single malts moving in that direction. I was going to say, I just saw where that's getting close to ratification. I believe. Yeah, yeah, that's exciting. It is very exciting. I, I think it deserves to be a category. There's enough producers out there now and enough cu- consumers. Uh, searching it out where it makes sense. Yeah. I don't think rice whiskey is there yet, but boy, if they all tasted like this, <laughs> it wouldn't take long. 
What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. And this really lingers. Like, yeah, it's still sitting there. The smoke is gone. That's for sure. Yeah, it was like drinking silk. I mean, yeah. it was really very, very smooth. Do you know anything about the distillery at all? Like, are they pot stilled? Are they hybrid or calm still? Or I do not know. No, no. I would guess pot stilled. Just I'm just, just guessing pot stilled. Yeah, because of the silkiness. I want a bottle. Can I get a bottle of this, or is it gone? <laughs> I think that one's gone. Oh but darn! I could probably, like I said, I just picked up another one from uh, Justin's House of Bourbon, so. I, they always have some. So I haven't opened it yet, but I yeah. expect it. Like I said, their single barrels have been very hit. Very mm. hit. Yes. And mid Justin's in a while. How are they doing down there? Um, yeah, they're doing well. I mean, they're still rolling out single barrels. Um, it's always a fun place to go have some pours. Um, the Lexington, Lexington one's a little smaller. Yeah. Um, but I'm actually going to be up in that area for a conference in um End, at the end of August. So, and it's right there at that area. I'll be staying at the Hyatt. And um, so I bet I maybe slide over there for a pour if, if I get a chance. This is our own conference. So I'll be, you're going to be pretty busy. I'll be doing some long days. And yeah. Wow. All right, folks. You never know. You just got to try them. Yeah. You just got to try them. And, and having somebody on the team like Todd here to, to introduce us some, to some new stuff is fantastic. He's, He's brought some whiskeys to my attention already in just the past few weeks that have just blown me away. So, and that's the thing, uh, you know, we talk about we, we obviously had some really big unicorns. I mean, those are great and all, but sometimes it's just so hard to find those that you know that's it's nice to find surprises like this. I mean, w- uh, one more time, price on this bottle. This single barrel run about sixty five bucks. Yeah, I mean. How awesome is that? I mean, how amazing is that? Hundred almost one hundred and twenty proof. Yeah. Wow. Good stuff. All right. I hate to set this one down. You know, I'm I'm sort of I'm just hee hawing, moving on to the next glass because this is so good. But I'm sure what you brought for us in the next glass is fantastic as well. Oh, I'll I'll be sure to leave you some of this. Just just a little bit. Yeah. I ought to throw a little bit in the backpack and take it to no, not backpack in the. Check bag. Check bag. <laughs> Take it down there. Fantastic. Cleanse the palate a little bit. Yeah, not to mention it's always important to hydrate, folks. In fact, I should be hydrating like 10 times more than normal because starting tomorrow, <laughs> say, I'm going to be consuming just a little bit of alcohol. It'll think. be interesting to know if like it's going to I saw where tomorrow here in Kentucky is going to be like 96 and that's without the heat index. So yeah, I'm gonna I be, looked at it's going to be interesting to see if you're going to be in a hotter temp or if I actually I looked at that. I, Melody and I were sitting on the couch last night watching the Olympics and we decided to sort of Google the whole weather forecast for Puerto Vallarta next week. And it looks like uh, 91 and raining every day. <gasps> Oh, no. But I, I think my guess is it's not really raining every day. It's a rainstorm comes in every day. Right, right. And that's typical on the west coast of any anywhere. Yeah. It, it's also typical of Scotland. Like, yeah. It rains and sunshines like every 15 minutes. It's yeah. kind of interesting. Well, I hope it doesn't do it every 15 minutes. <laughs> I hope we get this, uh, this 1 or 2 p.m. shower that comes through, which is very typical, like west coast of Florida happens a lot. You get this one or two p.m. shower that comes through, and then it's it's beautiful before and it's beautiful after. So I'm hoping for that. All right, so our uh, our fourth pour of the show is about as close to bourbon as we're going to get today. This is a rum from Foursquare, and this particular version is called Detente. So it's a single blended rum. And what they did was they took a 10-year rum that they aged in bourbon barrels and combined it with another barrel of rum that was aged in bourbon barrels for four years and then port for six years. So it's 10-year, basically 10-year age stated. And this one's 102 proof. It's Barbados. It's from Barbados. So uh, still staying uh, staying south. And uh, yeah, so. All right. Wow, this has a a pretty intense nose yeah, on it. Yeah, like dark molasses. 
Yeah, very burnt, much um, burnt caramel, like dark, dark fruits, deep, dark fruits, and uh, heavy sugar, burnt sugar. But it's not like this traditional rum nose on it, though. Not at all. It's a little bit more of a sort of a complex nose because what's been done to it. After trying this, I dubbed it Brum because it's Brum. <laughs> yeah, because it's so. It's you're, it, when we taste it, I think you'll, there's a lot of bourbon characteristics that 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 go into it for sure. Um, the um, you'll see like they come each year. They'll release like a particular. Um, it's called the ex- exceptional cast selection and they'll have like, they have actually vintages. So like, I think the latest one they just released was like a 2009. So you're talking a 15, 15 year rum. Four square. Four square. Cheers. Cheers. Now comes the rum. Yep. Very nice rum. Definitely. Um, like a uh, molasses. Yeah, sweet molasses. Sweet molasses. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a smoky note to it. Uh, yes, very much so. There's. That's not just the mezcal hanging around. It's, right. This is new. This is different. Yeah. It's like a subtle sweet smoke. This is a blended rum, uh, Barbados, a mixture of various blend uh, finishing styles. But basically, everything's 10 years. This is a 10-year-old rum. Yes. Yeah. And this runs about 70 bucks. Right? Oh. It did. This one might be a little harder to find. Now, I'm wondering, you know, r- rums are pretty much uh, the wild, wild west, the rules. So you can do just about anything you want to a rum. I wonder if there are any flavors added because this is very flavorful. It is very flavorful. But I'm going to assume, I'm just going to assume a quality rum does not have added flavors. Hopefully one of that age. Yeah. Yeah. 10 years. We should have enough barrel influence and enough, uh, yeah, aging notes to to not have to add anything to it. But you you have to be aware of that. You have to, I mean, with rums, you have to understand they're not as heavily guarded and regulated as other spirits. Same goes for a lot of other spirits. Canadian whiskey can have coloring. Exactly. So, scotches. This has a nice texture, too. We've had several um, pours today where the texture was really good. And I I kind of hope that distilleries start paying a lot more attention to that because it makes a big impact on me. Yeah, I think um, I think you'll start seeing some of the distilleries maybe just for giggles kind of maybe lower that barrel entry proof. I yeah. think that has a big. Exactly. Plays a lot on that. At least I kind of hope so. I mean, I think that's what makes Dusty so so fun sometimes because they went in at a lower barrel proof, so they weren't cut as much. So you get a lot of flavor, a softer mouthfeel, rather than that kind of like big, bold, maybe sometimes some burn from those 125 barrel proof. I don't drink uh, rums as often as I probably should. I am not a rum guy until I try this. That's Honestly. But again, I call it brum because it's <laughs> there's it's almost like a blend of bourbon and rum. It's so bourbon esque, I guess, but it's a little different. Now I've had some rums from the Nashville Barrel Company that have been phenomenal, much older rums, yeah, uh, um, rums that have been carefully uh, selected for bottling. I mean, there's. There's some pretty amazing stuff out there if you can get your hands on, and it does, it can get to a very high proof. Yeah, yeah. Um, Rolling Fork is another one I've seen Mm -hmm. some high, high proof stuff. Um, And Four Gate actually uses a lot of uh, rum barrels in their aging process as well, right? From time to time. Yeah, they, I'm sure they're on an NDA. I think they usually call it Barbadian dark casks or something like that. (laughs) But if you recall, not too long ago, um, Bardstown did a, collaboration with Foursquare where they took yeah one of their blended fusion type things or discoveries and aged it in some four four square barrels. Fantastic. This is so good. Oh man, I it you know you can find yourself in a slump every now and then where you just you're you're um 
constantly checking the box and trying new bourbons and trying new rise and, you know, and, and, and trying new distilleries and new expressions. And you just sort of get, then every now and then you get a chance to just step back, go off road. Yeah. Go off road. Have something uh, that's a little out of the ordinary, out of the usual. And, uh, wow, it can really put you in a good mood. This has really put me in a great mood. I was going to say, you should be ready for the beach. I'm ready for the beach. This is really good. Actually, I'm just going to live vicariously through you, I guess. Let's take lots of pictures. You had actually brought a bonus pour if we had time today. I did. And I'm going to say at this point, we have time. Oh, okay. If, if you want. I'm game. I mean, I'm it's, game. it's definitely the, the closer of the, of the, the pours for sure. Yeah. And there's a reason for that. Well, I, I'm I'm interested to try it. We didn't pre-pour this, but um, I'm I'm interested to try it. Sort of to close out the show today, and I I think our listeners deserve a bonus pour, and certainly you and I deserve a bonus pour. So let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Well, we'll just say that that this one is going to be. Uh, it should be a little bit of a surprise because of the proof, right? Yes. For right. sure. So, because I have another single barrel that I got because he brought this one to the tasting and ended up leaving, leaving it. But the other one I have is like 128. Okay. Well, this is well beyond 128. Yes. Like very much beyond it. So, what's the proof of the, what's in our port right now? What's the proof? 147.9. 140, not, not just hazmat, but like <laughs> almost to the point of, Auto ignition, yeah. right? <laughs> you got to be worried about spontaneous combustion. Here. Right. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, tell us what's in our glass. Okay. So this is Oak Clifty Hoosier Apple Brandy. This is a single barrel that um, their former distiller, Alan Bishop, brought to the Frankfurt Bourbon Society to share with us. And it's 147.9 proof. So this is an apple brandy? This is an apple brandy. Okay. So brandies can be very powerful. Yes. Brandies are. This actually, I believe it goes in at like 130. They distill it at 135. Yeah. So, and into the barrel at 135. Wow. Into the barrel at 135, and then it climbs up to 147 point something. At, at that proof, how much apple remains? Oh, some remains. I'm getting the nose. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I mean, it's Apple Jacks. I hate to say like a cereal, but yeah, Apple Jack cereal. Oh, what's the what's the um, what's the mascot of Apple Jacks? Come on, come on, you can do it. Dig deep, dig deep to that youthful sitting at the kitchen table I can remember milk the, over cereal. I, I can remember the sugar smacks bear and the frog and Tony the tiger, but uh Jacks. I don't wow. remember Apple Jacks either, but yeah. the Sugar Smacks was that. Sugar Smacks, there was the, the frog. The frog, but there was also the the very similar because Kellogg and Post, they both kind of had those similar yeah. similar cereals. And the other was a bear, if you recall. I I remember if that was Post or I think Kellogg was the frog and Post was the bear. And when you think back to your childhood, what was your favorite cereal? Captain Crunchberry. Captain Crunchberry. Yes. Wow. But I would always eat the yellow ones first, and that way I had all the berries last. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have to say that Apple Jacks was really close yeah. for me. Uh, it might have been my favorite. I liked Apple Jacks. I loved uh, – I, li I like Captain Crunch, too. Yeah. I was I, a I granola wasn't, kid, too. Grazer I wasn't brand. a big tricks kid. I wasn't yeah. a big uh, – um, uh, what's that? The the little leprechaun with the marshmallows. Lucky Charms. Lucky Char I wasn't yeah. a big Lucky Charms person. Yeah, they were all right. But um, I always I always liked Apple Jacks. Always a big fan. Yeah, Raisin Bran. I was a Raisin Bran kid. Like those. Yeah. Um, well, I tell you, the nose on this is great. It does not nose one forty seven. I was going to say it's. You'd think the nose, <laughs> the hairs like in your nose would just like <laughs> evaporate, but. All right, folks, we got the bonus pour here. Yeah. This is a an Indiana apple brandy and 147 proof out of Spirits of French Lick. Yeah. So if you're up there, you can find single barrels of this. Yeah. This was a single barrel or maybe even like a small release. I think he used to do like two or three barrels sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but they also have like a 90 proof version. And how long has Alan been gone from there? Um, he left about six. 
maybe six, eight months ago. Okay. Well, he was definitely a, uh, uh, a, di- a master distiller that had uh, all the chops. All the chops. Loved his history. Yeah. I mean, especially Indiana distilling history. But, yeah, just. Well, wherever he lands, I'm sure will be an amazing thing. He's at, I believe it's Potoka Lake Distilling or something similar area. Yeah. But I'm very excited. I know he's very excited. Yeah. to. Well, we'll all see what happens to Spirits of French Lake in his absence. Uh, he's a he's a big vacuum to fill, right? I mean. But for sure. I mean, he was definitely the face and voice for that brand, for sure. Yeah. I mean, he, I mean, he's fun. Like, if you follow anybody on Instagram, he's a fun one to follow. I mean, yeah. He distills in the wild. Like, I've seen him use mushrooms. And who oh, knows? my goodness. Yeah, just like, yeah. All right, I'm ready to taste it. This is a, this is a, I love apple brandy, by the way. I'm a big fan. Cheers. Oh, super buttery. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. It's got a little heft, it but does. not as much as you would think. Like I was when we tried this, I was like, "Oh gosh, this is gonna I, taste like gasoline." And it's okay. It's it's definitely approaching gasoline. It's got its kick, but I think it's still approachable. But it has a great buttery palate to it, and um, I can just imagine, you know, late seventeen hundreds, early eighteen hundreds, England brandies were all the rage, right? I mean that. That was it. Yeah. Even I would even add colonial colonial U.S. I mean, in the same time, because it took a while for them to figure out, you know, barley and rye. And yep. obviously corn took a while. to. And uh, the uh, brandies were not cheap at that time. They were definitely uh, a drink of aristocracy. I mean, the common folk drank beer. They drank mead. And. The aristocracy drank brandies and they would drink brandies that were, uh, well, very much like today, very fine to average. This would be considered, in my mind, a very fine aristocrat brandy. This would be something that you would be in a big parlor in a mansion in England in the late 1700s sipping on this. And you would be like, oh, my gosh. This is really good stuff. Be interesting to know if they are had anything this this high proof though back then. Do you think? I mean, I don't know. Probably not. I wouldn't think no, so. No, probably not. Maybe maybe Benjamin Franklin. Now, for those of you un- that don't know, brandy is cognac, but it's called brandy because it's not from the cognac region. That's correct. So. And this is double pot distilled. I don't know if I said that already, but just in case. And yeah, Michigan apples. And yeah, I was like stunned. It just kind of, it takes your breath away in two different ways. One, because it's so good. And two, because it's got that. Heft. Now I've had some brandies from Copper and Kings and they don't really get to where this is. The ones I've had so far, there's some good ones. This makes me want to explore brandies a little more. I've had a yeah. few of the, the French ones, lower proof ones, but Wow, what a great way to finish up the show. Yeah, this is one of those, a little drop of water will soften it a little bit. I'm going to try it, but you got to be careful. Just a just a tad, right? I don't know. You could probably go half. If you went half and half, it's going to cut it to 70, 70 what, uh, 75 proof or, or 73 I put, proof. I put, a, I put uh, yeah, I probably went half and half on it. So I'm probably around 80 proof right now. Okay. So I went, this would be I went to, a typical 80 proof. Brandy off the shelf. I went uh, maybe a couple drops, so I'm okay. maybe down to 120. Okay. Oh. Oh. The nose really opens up, yeah, I think. Yeah, I'm going to say my nose really opened up a lot. Gotten bitter for me. Bitter. Yeah. So I took it too far, I think. Still good. Yeah. Still nice. But I've got a little bit of a bitter note to it. And I, I, I don't think it's something you want in a brandy. I may not have put enough water because I'm still kind of like, that's still got the <laughs> apple smash. 
Oh, my goodness. Well, I hope we have opened the eyes a little bit of our listeners that they go out and try some brandies, some rice whiskeys, some sotols, sotol and mezcal. And man, we, we should do this again because there literally are hundreds of regional spirits uh, that we that we could present. Yeah, you could even I, um, a fellow by the name of Tony Minicella recently had we had a little tasting event with him and he's kind of known for his he's a big world whiskey connoisseur so yeah. he had a little small tasting for some of us and we tried a British rye yeah an English rye which was very interesting we had an older version of a 12 year um, scotch non-peated so that was I mean it was probably a 20 year old bottle that he had just a little bit left that he shared we had a Japanese whiskey also very interesting and very scotch like um, and uh, yeah it's it's kind of fun to step out of your comfort zone every once in a while. Well, we'd love to hear from you, roadies. If you've got an idea for a show, if you've if you've tasted some uh, whiskeys of the world that you think are deserving of an episode, let us know. Jump into the roadies. Yeah, and after trying Amroot, the Amroot uh, Bart Sound, I want to try Amroot on its own. Just yeah, to, absolutely. Yeah, I think that'd be interesting. I, you know, we really haven't done like a Japanese whiskey show either. Taiwanese. Taiwan's have some great whiskeys. I was going to say, I've never had Baiju, which yeah. is the most popular, I believe it's the most popular liquor in the world. Yeah. The Chinese liquor, Baiju. We really need to do it. So The Baiju we'll, Road. Well, <laughs> the Baiju <laughs> Road. <laughs> Absolutely. But yeah, this was fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Todd, thank you for, again, another idea for a great show. You've brought some inspiration and freshness to the show. And uh, we're so glad to have you on board. Thank you. It's, like I said, it's my pleasure. And yeah, it's fun to always get with you, Jim. And we got some great shows coming up. We've uh, been talking to some distilleries. We've got uh, some things in the works. So we'll, we'll have some good shows here coming up in the future. Of course, the uh, Bourbon Heritage Month is not that far into our distant future. Uh, we are in August now. September is Bourbon Heritage Month. Yep. That's when uh, everyone makes their pilgrimage to... Uh, to Kentucky. It would be nice if we got a little, not quite, an Indian summer would be nice. nice yeah. And, yeah. It would be. Rather than a blazing, now, I know, a I blazing know. late fall <laughs> or early fall. <laughs> I know that uh, Bourbon on the Banks is the first week in October. Uh, for purposes of, you know, Whiskey Heritage Month, we're, we're just going to extend that a week. It's five weeks, right? I think so, it includes, too. Yeah. It includes Bourbon on the Banks. <laughs> We hope you get to make it this year uh, into our area and visit us. Uh, we're going to be at the uh, Kentucky Bourbon Festival. I think, Todd, are you attending the Mash and Journeys event? I am. That's the, like I said, the week before, 28th, 29th. I'll probably go up that Friday. I, I don't think I'll stay the night, but um, just go visit those guys, grab a couple bottles of the, the barrel I picked, and yeah. See a lot of whiskey friends. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to make it this year. I've I've been a long-standing Patreon member for uh Mash and Drum and uh I now do they have a separate uh Patreon account for Mash and Journey? Uh they have two separate accounts. Two separate accounts, but when they, they do feed into when the they same do barrel picks like yeah, like so they're the higher tier you are, you get the announcement or you get the First dibs at purchasing, and then yeah. it kind of works its way down. That's the way it works. Well, those guys are killing it. Uh, if you haven't listened to uh, the Mash and Drum or My Bourbon Journey on YouTube, I highly su suggest that you check them out. Put them onto your watch list. Uh, they ha both have great palettes, and they do a lot of barrel picks, and it's always a lot of fun. So I've been a member since almost since the beginning. Yeah. So lots of fun. All right, folks, we had a great time. Shall we do this again? Shall yeah. we go off road once yeah. in a while? Yeah. I'm going to go come in the aisles of the liquor stores looking for <laughs> weird and interesting things. We might have to pull Amzie and, uh, Amzie and Robin on that one, maybe. Yeah. That would be good. Yeah. Cause so, I know, I know Amzie's got some, he's got some interesting stuff. So China and India, two of the countries with the largest populations, populations. in the world, uh, I think, uh, a show highlighting whiskeys from China and India might be a great, great show. What okay. Do you One or the other or both together. I don't know. But India's killing it. 
right? I mean, yeah. good stuff. Yeah. But I'm root. <laughs> Definitely. All right, folks. Well, you can find the Bourbon Road on all social media outlets. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, Threads. We're on all of them. Every single week we put out an episode on Wednesdays. Usually drops Tuesday night at, well, actually Wednesday morning at 1 a.m. Sometimes I'm a little late. We have a long night. Well, whatever. It'll always come out on Wednesday. So just be ready for it. The way you won't miss an episode is to scroll on to the top of that app you're on and hit that subscribe button. That way you don't have to worry about it. You'll get that notification every week when we release an episode saying that uh, Jim and Todd have dropped another one. It's time to relax and enjoy another episode of the Bourbon Road on that long drive to work or while you're cutting your grass or or whatever you're doing. Or it's always a, a lot of fun. Or having a pour. Or having a pour. Uh, we do hope you'll join us every single week. But until the next time, we'll see you down the, the Bourbon, Bourbon Road. Road.